Well, good evening, everybody. My name is Steve Norris, as he said. Um, I do wear a lot of hats. I like to do a lot of different stuff, so explaining what I do is kind of complicated. Uh, I do single family deep energy retrofits with uh, a partner, uh, Corey McDermott from Beacon High Performance Home. I also do project development for a construction company called Plaid Shirt Projects. Basically, I tee up multifamily rental projects for them, which kind of led me in an interesting direction. I've ended up doing a lot of consulting for investors and developers on multifamily rentals, which is all about the pro forma and the numbers. And that's kind of what I want to talk today. So it's a really good follow up to what Axel and Heather were talking about because it's, they were doing a single family case study, multi-generational, so two dwellings. But at the next size, the next stage, is there a case for these things? Um, and the reason I want to talk about that today is because as an industry, I feel like we don't do a really good job of making the case for sustainability because it's complicated. It's not simple. Um, I think Doug said it good with, uh, we have to be able to win minds of the decision makers, which is really difficult to do. Um, and then Axel at the end of their, uh, their presentation as well said, it's not as cost prohibitive as everybody thinks, but saying something is not cost prohibitive is not making a good case for, hey, you should do this as an investor. We can look at the next slide there. So I want to do a little bit of a role play in your mind. I want you to imagine a friend comes over to you and says, hey, look, I own two, three properties. I've had them for a while. I want to do something. Don't know if I want to sell them off or I'd really like to get in the game. I'd like to be a part of this and not just have somebody else make the money off of these things. So what kind of build should I do? What's your answer? Second question they're going to ask you, they're going to say, hey, I heard you were at this passive house event at Builders and Brew. What do you think of the sustainable stuff? How sustainable should I make that? Or is it not practical? Does it cost too much to do those kinds of things? So ask yourself this question, how equipped are you right now to make that case? So a little bit of background. I started with a small multifamily builder about 18 years ago. I wasn't from the industry, but I was keen to be green. So I kept asking, bugging my employers all the time, can we do this? And they said, sure, run with it. So what that became was a constant arm wrestling about, well, how far can we take this? You know, could we do a metal roof? Can I do more insulation on the outside? And it was always this back and forth, well, make a case for it. And the fact was, I just wasn't equipped to do that. I didn't have a case. I didn't have the knowledge, didn't have the information, didn't have the experience to say anything other than, well, it's the right thing to do, or people are starting to catch on. Maybe our customers will pay more. And you know what? They weren't. So I actually didn't have a financial case because we weren't selling homes for any higher than when we were selling our regular homes. We started certifying built green, uh, lead silver certified. We were adding solar panels. Most clients, I would ask them when they moved in. I'm like, so how'd you make their decision? Was, did, was efficiency part of this? And they're like, no, not at all. Uh, next slide, please. So what I learned was a couple things. First was it matters who the key decision makers are when a project is being built. And it also matters what that time horizon is. So if you go to the next slide there, and the next one, and the next one. So in the model that I was working in, the key decision maker was the developer, the company I was working for. We were also the builder, but we were gathering investors, buying land, and deciding what kind of project we could sell to homeowners. So if you think of the time horizon with that, we were trying to sell these homes before these places were finished. So like zero months of, of turnover. The home buyers we were selling to young professionals, singles, young couples, maybe starting a family. Most of them were trying to resell these places within two to five years. So they weren't thinking about a very long time horizon. So at these short time horizons, building sustainably is very expensive. And if you go to the next slide, that makes our case as boots on the ground, architects, builders, trades, designers, that makes it very difficult for us to make that case on that time horizon. But that's changing. So if you turn to the next slide, and I'll kind of rip through these quickly because a lot of us know about these things. Um, we have a housing crisis, surprise, surprise, which is not going away because we have a very strong economy. We're in a great place to work. Uh, we have very strong migration, and that's going to last for a while. 
We also have a climate emergency. Our city council, which is divided on everything, actually called a climate emergency, which is amazing. So the city is incentivizing housing and particularly multifamily housing, which is inherently more sustainable to begin with. So that's a win for us. We're slowing down urban sprawl. We're starting to build more multifamily stuff. And the next slide shows this idea of the missing mi middle, that we're building smaller units, less exterior envelope, which also makes construction more sustainable as well too. The next slide. And what's exciting now is that municipalities like the city of Calgary, the province, the federal government are making that connection between climate and the way that we build homes and structures. So they're creating new bylaws, new rezoning to allow us to build more units, uh, that missing middle product for the sake of sustainability as well as our housing crisis. So they're linking those two things together. So we have some new zonings that have been created, RCG, HGO that are facilitating this uh, for builders. The next slide shows the next exciting piece that some of you may not be aware of is that Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation provides incentivized financing for certain projects. Preferred lending on projects that are affordable, accessible, or show up to a 40% um, reduction in emissions. This is changing the game because if you go to the next slide, you can see the lending terms you can get up to 95% loan to cost or loan to value lending up for up to 50 years amortization. So if you're an investor or a developer and you think about those numbers, it's mind boggling. It changes the game. And so this is changing things very quickly in Calgary. So this makes the case for building multifamily and building sustainably. Now, an additional point is that this is only for purpose built rental and it's for projects of five or more units, including secondary suites. So why is that an important shift? If you go to the next slide, the fact is that this changes the decision maker from developer to primarily to the investor. So what a lot of people don't realize is we have investors from Hong Kong, Toronto, Vancouver, all over the world looking at Calgary, looking at our market and saying, it doesn't make sense for me to build anywhere else, I'm coming here and I'm gonna build with this financing, and I'm gonna build multifamily in your city. So that changes the time horizon. So if you flip to the next slide, you're thinking that's gonna be at least a five year hold, maybe 10 or longer, because, because these are real estate investment trusts, um, bigger developers, people looking at long-term holds um, that provide positive cash flow over generations decades. So much longer time horizons than we typically look at here. It's a much more European model. If I'm going to own this thing in my family for decades or generations, then how does that change the calculation? So that kind of levels the playing field a little bit. Makes it a lot easier for us to make the case for these things. So we have different key decision maker. We have rental owners, real estate portfolios, investment trusts, and we have different time horizon. We're committing to rental buildings, not necessarily selling units, committing to long-term financing. And even if you sell that building, that financing is transferable as well to the next owner. So that makes all those benefits that Heather talked about a lot more relevant. So what are those long-term benefits to a real estate investor over a 5, 10, 20, 50 year time span? If you look at the next slide, the way that this case is made with investors and developers is by the pro forma. So it's making a case for higher rent, lower vacancy, lower operational costs, future value of the building, and then finally in the red, what does the mortgage look like? Can I do this cost effectively? Which brings me to, to my project. So I am doing a nine unit purpose built rental project with a couple partners. Uh, finance through CMHC, designed to passive house standards, and targeting net zero with the addition of solar PV. And through the process, we're hoping to put real numbers to all of those things. So just the way Heather and Axel wrapped up their presentation with, look, after a year, this is what it looks like. Here's the benefits that the homeowner lists, here's the financial case. That's what we'd like to do on this project as well. Now that, that information is out there for projects in other parts of the world, other building types, but I don't 
think it's terribly convincing to speak to people about projects in other places done by other people. Sometimes you have to have something that's local, has been done recently, shows real world numbers at this time, and that's what we hope to do through this project. So I think in order to have the right metrics to be convincing, you have to know the right questions to answer. So on the revenue side, how much more will a tenant pay for a suite that has comfortable and consistent temperature, has good indoor air quality even through those smoke events, is quiet, doesn't have noise from mechanical systems or the exterior, and is it something that somebody can point to and say, hey, I live in a place that has an environmental consciousness to it, and I have a place to plug in my electric car? Very difficult question to answer. I don't know if we'll be able to do it really well, but we're going to do our best. And the a related question, how much longer would these tenants stay compared to an average tenancy after living in that place for a year? And they've experienced for themselves what those benefits are. How much revenue could be generated annually from an increased rent or a flat rate utility structure for tenants? So if I'm owning that building and I've invested all this money in thick walls, solar panels, um, am I able to raise the rent and include utilities? So maybe I'm charging an extra $125 a month, but a tenant's coming expecting to pay $150 a month utilities. They're like, okay, rent's a little higher, but my utilities are included. I'll do that. That's going to become more valuable over time because our utility costs are going to continue to increase. There's also going to be, well, there is scheduled increases in carbon taxes. So maybe that amount increases over time. So how long does it take for that actual revenue stream to pay off the solar panels, the thick walls, all those upgrades? After that point, it's a revenue stream for eternity. Operational expenses. Are there quantifiable reductions in the ongoing service costs? Um, and also the reserve amount that you have to set aside every month. If you only have electric appliances, you've done a good job of your air and weather barriers, so you have a reduced envelope risk. If you've built in resilient features with your siding and your roof lines, and you don't have to upgrade those things in the future, how much more valuable is that um, asset? That last one's a big one. Building codes also have an energy code component now, and it's already starting to be implemented, and you'll see this over the next few years rolling out, is any wall you touch is now gonna have to be upgraded to meet new energy codes. So if I'm owning a building, that needs a big envelope upgrade, I'm looking at hundreds of thousands of dollars. In this case, that's already done. Much cheaper to do it up at the beginning. So is there a way to factor that into a pro forma? So when you're showing it to investors, say, look, in 20 years, we're not going to be replacing siding. We're good. We're not going to be upgrading insulation on the exterior of the building. Next slide. Related to that is future value. How much more valuable is this asset in five years, 10 years, 20 years? When you have proven energy performance, uh, you have increased awareness from investors and tenants about uh, healthy homes. You, don't, you know you don't need to upgrade the building. You have a transferable, great lending from CMHC, and you have this uh, utility revenue stream. Can, how do we express this in a pro forma to convince an investor to slide? And then you know the first question that everybody asks is the construction. How do I bring down the mortgage by doing this cost effectively? You're going to spend more in design. You're going to spend more in assemblies, insulation and air tightness, and solar PV. What some people don't know is you might actually spend less in mechanical systems. In our particular project, that's the case because we don't have big fan coils moving air around. So how can you cost optimize these things? And that's where the case for Passive House comes in. So I'll just do a quick review. Passive house, there's some really important things to it, especially at the multifamily scale, because the way you cost optimize is to plan it right from the beginning. So that's the integrated planning and design process where you're looking at the building as a system and you're doing it right from the front. Next slide. You're looking at, okay, what do we have for solar exposure? How are we gonna get thick walls when we have certain lot lines? Um, how are we gonna get an airtight air weather barrier that's protected over time. You're looking at all these things as building as a system. Next slide. You're considering the principles of high energy efficiency, a lot of insulation, trying to eliminate as many thermal bridges as possible, having a protected airtight barrier, 
do we need to spend triple the amount on cold climate certified passive house windows? Maybe you do. And what, how are we gonna get good ventilation throughout all areas of the home so that it's comfortable and we have good air quality throughout? And hopefully, and this is part of the passive house uh, um, value proposition, is that you're simplifying your mechanical system. You're using the sun as a furnace. And then you're just using ventilation to move around the appropriate temperatures through the house. So we're not trying to do this with complicated cutting edge technology. It's really simplifying those things, uh, which is the difference from uh, some other approaches. So how does this, how is this applied to our project? A uh, number of things that I'll run through quickly. We dropped the front building from three stories to two. So it enabled the, that back build, building to get maximum solar exposure. Simple roof designs. We played with window sizes and locations to use that sun as a furnace as much as possible. We looked at the sizes of overhangs and getting good shading in the summer. And we did a really detailed cost analysis on the windows. Next slide. Uh, we, we planned a uh, cost-effective constructible wall assembly, which is super key. We have our air vapor barrier inside a chase wall so that it will never get damaged by tenants hanging pictures on the wall. We dropped sanitary services from the back building under our front building instead of coming through our building envelope. We've designed thermal breaks throughout our concrete foundation. Next slide. Um, through the design process, we realized we can share heat pumps in the upper and lower units at the front. We only need our ERV for distribution of heat and cooling. Uh, we're evaluating some different uh, water solutions and we're laying out our electrical distribution up front and comparing that load against the potential for solar production. Um, so we know that we can be net zero at the end of the day as well too. So our goal of the project is really to experience this and to go through construction, go through a year or so of occupancy, collect this data and try to make that case and be able to promote that case to other people. So hopefully I'll be back here in a couple years. Thank you.